Hello and welcome to the LA Venture Podcast, where David Waxman and Minnie Ingersoll, partners and investors at 10110. We've watched Los Angeles grow from a sleepy tech backwater to a bustling mecca of startup opportunity. Through conversations with fellow investors and a few other special guests, we'll deliver an insider's view of the LA tech scene. Today, David and I are here at Techstars LA on Wilshire Boulevard. There are probably a dozen other companies here right now, so hoping we can hold on to this conference room. Anyhow, I believe that Techstars does more seed investing than anyone else in the country. And best of all, we have special guest Anna Barber with us. Anna is managing director of Techstars LA and one of my new favorite people in LA. Hi, Minnie. Hi, David. Really happy to be here with you. You are also two of my favorite people in LA. So thanks for having me. We can have a little love fest. Thanks, Anna. So, um, Anna, we've known each other for a bit. So you're you're actually one of my favorite older friends in L.A. Um, thanks, David. Didn't mean that. That came let's, out. Just, let's just get it right yeah. out there on the table. So, Anna, you're managing director of Techstars. How long have you been doing this? Um, what were you doing beforehand, and how did you get here? I am the inaugural managing director of this program, which means you know Techstars decided to put a city accelerator in L.A., um, in 2017 and and I was hired to launch it. So we're now in the third class of Techstars LA. We ran it in 2017, 18, and now 19. So a total of 30 companies uh, have gone through it. And in terms of what I was have been doing before, I mean, how far back do you want to go? We could spend an hour. Well, let's 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 just touch on some of the highlights. You can you can skip the part about being little when you were a kid. Um, <laughs> where were you? Where did you grow up? Actually, I grew up in New York City, and my family was in publishing. So I had this very fun hippie childhood. I grew up in a brownstone in Chelsea. My mom was a literary agent. My dad was an editor, and there were just books and writers everywhere. And you know, I rode the subway to school. It was like an iconic New York City childhood. Cool. Well, that that explains why you're so cool. Um, well, in in your career, what brought you to to this? And you can you can give us highlights. Yeah. So I was, you know, I never really had a strong vision of what I wanted to do with my life. I I like a lot of people in that position. I went to law school. And I got a job at a corporate law firm, and one day I got a call from a recruiter and who said, do you want to go to McKinsey? And I thought that sounded fun. So I was very much kind of following the breadcrumbs of whatever was interesting at the time. And I ended up out in San Francisco in 1999 working for a tech startup, which was PetStore.com. So that's kind of originally how I got into tech. Um, and then a few years after that, I w- ended up down here in LA, um, kind of reconnecting with what my parents had done, working with creative people. So I was a talent manager for film and television for about seven years. And uh, then I decided to kind of take another shift because I met a woman on an airplane who had a great idea for a business. And we became, we became business partners and started a company called Scribble Press. Um, so I would say until really until my 40s, I really followed my curiosity and my interests, and it, it just took me you know, to a bunch of different places. And then I finally realized, you know, maybe even just about five or six years ago, that I had to pick a direction and pick a lane, um, you know, and, and, and kind of build a career. Cool, and so helping entrepreneurs has been your career of choice for a while now, and, um, and you're at Techstars LA, but when I first moved here, it was a little hard for me to navigate there, there was uh, Techstars Health, I guess, at, as partnership with Cedars, and there's currently Techstars Music, I believe, is is also sitting out here. And space. And space, yes. So we have three Techstars programs in LA. So just a little background uh, on Techstars. It was started in 2008 in Boulder, Colorado, by two founders that had sold their company, and they wanted to angel invest, but they thought there's got to be a better way than just writing a check, because that's just you know, startups need so much more than just money. Um, and so they did it as an experiment. They teamed up with Brad Feld and they, they launched the first accelerator, you know, Techstars accelerator, and it worked really well. Um, and so now we're a global company. We employ almost 300 people. There's 49 Techstars programs around the world. And they're kind of a mix between these city programs like the one I run that are really focused on the ecosystem and then corporate accelerators that tend to be focused on a specific vertical. So here in LA, we've got three. We've got the space program, um, which is a really exciting program investing in you know future tech around, around space and satellites. And then the music program, 
program, which invests in everything around the music ecosystem. And those are both supported by corporate partners in those industries. Whereas this one is really a general program investing in anything under the sun and focused specifically on building this ecosystem. So it's a bit tough to navigate because we have all of these really micro funds. So each accelerator is really a micro fund, each with its own investment thesis and its own managing director. And so we're aware that part of the challenge is how do we engage with other investors you know, and with startups when there's so many of us you know, running these kind of micro funds. And do each of them have 10 companies? Because you have 10 companies in your current cohort. Yes. And are they, so they're all 10 companies in 12-week uh, programs? Yes. So the model is something we've worked on over the past 10 years. So we've now done this over 180 times, I think. So every time we want, run one of these programs, we learn a little bit more and gets a little bit better. But, you know, the, the philosophy is a small group. So keeping it really to 10 companies so we can focus on all of them. Um, and build a community around those 10 companies is part of, of the philosophy of what we do. And it's 12 weeks because that's really the amount of time that you can do this focused work and have, you know, with a sustained level of effort that we, that we, that we have here, which is pretty intense. Yeah, it, it is an intense level of effort. So how do you, how do you manage it? Because you must have people helping you. Yes. Yeah, so we have, the, we have all the founders move in, and then we have a program team. So we hire... Um, associates who generally are career switching, sort of early career, um, to come in and support the, the, the companies and work with them. So we generally have someone who does marketing, someone on finance, uh, someone on design, someone on investor relations, you know, that, that are then kind of just helping the teams augment their own staff um, and also supporting, you know, running the operations of the program. And then there's a program manager who kind of manages the day-to-day -day operations. And then I'm kind of the lead uh, mentor, advisor, coach, you know, investor rep for the companies. Got it. And then as I, all, I know, you also work with companies that were in your Techstars classes, I know that because we're invested in a couple things together, how much time do you spend on that? That's something I'm really trying to figure out because it's now that I have 20, I have 20 investments per, you know, alum companies, you know, I, I've seen, I've talked to four of them this week. So that's four hours that I'm not working with this group and next year they're going to be 30. So I haven't quite figure out, figured out how that's going to scale because you know, these are, these are to me long-term relationships and I want to keep helping and supporting my portfolio as they grow. So I'm sure it's something that every early stage investor deals with as your portfolio gets bigger. And I can't say that I've really figured out how to scale that well. Yeah. Well, when you figure it out, you can tell me because <laughs> I do, we do have that, that issue and we try and stick with, I mean, we, we are sticking with companies throughout their entire journey. And as you know, the journey of a startup could be a long time. Uh, and they add up. It does. So, it does. And I, you know, I'm working on all the same productivity hacks everyone else says. What can I handle over email? What actually requires a meeting? When do you need me as opposed to I can just connect you to someone else? And where do I really need to dig in and spend an hour and, you know, have a real conversation? The other thing I thought we could learn from a bit was in helping the companies, like we don't, we're a fund, we're not an accelerator, but you said that the way you think about it is it's these 90 days where you get to help companies as much as you can accelerate. And so I'd love to know more about you guys have honed this process of helping companies. You know, what sort of activities do you do? What do you think is most helpful? What should we copy and, and bring to our founders? So the, 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 the program's designed in three phases, and one of which you just participated in, which is mentor office hours. Like, we've been instructed not to call it this, but everyone calls it mentor madness. So I'll just go ahead and call it mentor madness. Um, and so mentor madness has three purposes. So first of all, we curate the people that come in for that really carefully. We want to make sure they understand the journey of a founder, you know, ideally by having been one, so they really know what it's like to sit in those shoes, that they have deep subject matter expertise, and that they are coming in ready to help with no personal agenda of their own. So we spend a ton of time. Most of the work happens before that they even get in that room in terms of making sure it's the right people in the room with the founders. So then we, we set up between 60 and sometimes up to 100 meetings with each company over a three-week period. So they're cycling through these 20-minute meetings with these 60 to 100 people. 
This does three things for the, for the founders. One, massively increases their network in a really short period of time. So there's now a large group of people that wasn't aware of their company that is now aware and willing to help them. Two, they get um, a massive amount of feedback all at once, and that enables them to see patterns in either where are the weak points in their story, where do they really need to dig in more, what are people perceive as a concern or an opportunity that maybe they didn't see. And then the third thing is from that group, they each pick a kind of an advisory board, if we call them lead mentors, of three to five people that commit to working with them week by week as they go through the program. So that's kind of the first section is that trial by fire to go through men Mentor Madness. We can I ask all sorts of questions about Mentor Madness? Because yeah, totally. I just went through and it was super interesting. So one thing, and I think you said this was kind of a new trial thing, was the mentors all entered our feedback. And I forget exactly what the questions were, but you know, what would be a strength and weakness sort of thing? about this company. And then we got to see each other's feedback and vote on it, which was also super interesting. And so then the entrepreneurs have this whole written feedback that's also been like sort of voted up and down as the other mentors found it useful. I was kind of blown away by the whole process. Yeah, so we collect all this data. So I was thinking about after, after last year, you know, we've got 80 people coming in and they're each giving feedback on 10 companies. So that's 800 pieces of data right there, and we're not really doing anything other than putting it in a Google Sheet. And I thought, we're a tech company accelerator, like we need to be doing this better, right? We need to be using data and analytics, you know, to kind of drive this process and make it even more efficient and effective. So we've partnered for this pilot with a company called CrowdSmart um, that was was originally designed to help make better investment decisions through crowdsourcing feedback on startups, and we're using it for a different purpose here, which is to help companies learn and grow. Um, but what what has come out of that as the as the kind of output is um, <clears throat> all the feedback that the mentors gave, and and there's a score. So it's do you think this is a compelling business opportunity, and do you think this is a good team, basically? So it's it's sort of scoring the idea and the team, but then giving specific reasons why. And then those reasons are now organized into themes. And so we have a dashboard that's showing the companies, here's the four themes about which the mentors feel the most positive, and here's the four themes where the mentors feel the most concern. So it could be market opportunity is you know, scored really high and mentors felt really positive, and go-to-market strategy is where they have concerns, or you know, team is where they have concerns. And that's gonna tell the teams where they need to focus as we go into the next phase, which is you know, really the work phase. So we're trying to add extra value to that feedback rather than just give a data dump to actually draw insights from it using you know, AI and kind of crowdsourced reviews. So in Mentor Madness, like when they are coming in and asking good questions, is that something you've coached them to, to do? So I don't so much coach the mentors on this, but sometimes, I, but I do coach the founders on this, and it's something I think about, which is this idea of like asking a powerful question. So, you know, if you think about interviewing as a as a proxy, you know, asking somebody questions that are have kind of a one directional answer about your background or what you've done in the past, you know. They're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna roll out the spool of tape that they always roll out. If you ask someone an open-ended question that asks them to imagine the future or create new possibilities, you're gonna get a much more interesting question. So my answer, so my favorite question to ask founders is, what's the future vision for your customers that you see that they don't see yet? So, which allows them to really live in the future of what they're trying to create. And another version of this is if everything goes right for you over the next two years, what will the world look like? So taking it even broader and asking them, you know, what's the world gonna look like if you do this? Because the thing is if the founders don't have a, like a really big vision, and this doesn't have to be about impact, it's just it has to be about wanting to like meaningfully change the world for someone in some way, then like there's nothing there, right? They've got to be able to like live in that. And also just the interesting thing psychologically is just asking someone from that, that question actually puts them in a different frame of mind and into a more optimistic frame of mind because they're living inside the optimistic future that they're trying to create. But it just seems like that skill in itself is, is really valuable. At first when you said 
the meetings were 20 minutes and I, I've done it before, so I know, I thought, well, that's kind of short. You can't really get to know anybody in 20 minutes. But if you're teaching people to go through 80 mentors and do their pitch 80 times and get it all across in, in 20 minutes with substance, that's a terrific thing. Yes. And we are teaching them to reset if they feel the conversation isn't going anywhere. If you feel like you're an autopilot and you're just chatting and, you know, we teach everyone on both sides to just say time out, like, let's talk about something real. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's just teaching them to engage on a deeper level and, and getting them to do that. And, you know, it's hard to do when you're tired. So it works sometimes better than others at the end of the day. Sometimes it's less effective. But, um, but I also think just practicing that skill of how do I really connect with something and talk about something meaningful is going to be useful, you know, in other contexts. Um, but I, I think you were saying there were three parts and then I yeah. imagine it made you stick on the first part. So now we're in really the work part, which is about um, kind of rapid learning week to week to, to get to product market fit. So they're all very clear on what they don't know and what's most important for them to learn about, um, whether it's who's their right target customer or have they built the right product for that customer or how are they going to reach their customers. So it's all very customer focused learning. So we're doing that right now and, and um, trying to stay really, really focused on doing the right things so they're not wasting any time. Um, and they can, they can, you know, accelerate. And when we, you know, when we think about accelerate, it's really about accelerate your learning. So we're not looking for revenue or traction at this point. We're looking for learning and understanding and getting closer to product market fit. Um, and so one of the things I hammer on is, you know, don't go after revenue. Um, if it's non-target revenue, the only thing revenue is worth at this point is proving that people like your product. So we're not looking for artificially building growth by kind of piecing it together unless it supports the story that you've found product market fit. Yeah. When, when we spoke to Mark Mullen uh, for this podcast, he made that point that one of his diligence items is to figure out if the early revenue he's seeing is actually related to the product that's going forward and to make sure that, that the revenue is not just a, you know, masking Absolutely. Uh, what's actually so I call that target and non-target revenue. And I think revenue is kind of a vanity metric that it gives founders a lot of security to see a revenue number um, going up. And I try to strip that away so that they don't get a false sense of security. And this is something, honestly, that I personally have gotten better at doing over the past couple of years. Um, and I've really become a bear about this year because I've seen it hurt people in advance I mean, in the past, in that they've just they've gotten hooked on doing anything they can just to drive the revenue number up, which they're not using this program correctly if they're doing that because they're not getting they're not using it as a learning environment. And what this is is it is an environment to learn a ton about where the scalable business is here in a really short time. So we want to make sure that's what they're focused on. Right. But but part of your job is to also help companies, or part of the program, I would imagine, is to help companies get funding afterwards. And sometimes VCs are also attracted to seeing early revenue and, and wanting that growth. Do you think um, do you think that most VCs get it, like, like Mark does? I mean, that's a, that's a good question. I guess I try to focus on focus on the long term what's going to build what's going to help you build a strong business as opposed to what's going to help you get the next check you know my mantra is vcs are not your customer vcs are not your customer <laughs> yeah exactly and i get that it's tempting to want to package up what's going to look really good on a slide or in a deck in 2 months when you're trying to pitch for a seed round but the fact is if it's not going to hold up 3 years down the road because it's not built on a solid foundation then i am not going to support you know, that kind of thinking. I, I think I heard you even talk about this in relation to what is traction. And you were saying you can spend money and get customers, but that's not traction. Exactly. Right. So I think people automatically think traction is just that hockey stick growth. 
And for me, traction is you've identified your tiny group of early adopters that is passionate about what you're doing. And that then the second thing is you've identified how you can find them. And the third thing is you've identified how you can grow that group. And the fourth thing is you've identified how you can have a great margin on the product that you're selling them. So it's just the building blocks, you know, starting from them very inside, you know, and, and kind of moving out to building a massively sustained, profitable, large, sustainable business. I'd love to talk a little bit about the front end of this process, the picking, because 10 is probably not the number that you start with at the top of the funnel. How many people apply? Applications, hundreds, well into the hundreds. And then, so, so some people, all I ever see of them is there's an application and we read it and multiple people usually read it and I'll spend five minutes on each one. But then I actually talked to, last year I spoke to 290 different companies so it's a little scary because I'm making 10 investment decisions from hundreds of companies all at the same time, you know, in a time period of a couple months. So, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a process where I wouldn't, I'm not doing the same process that somebody who's, who's, you know, or investing around the year is doing. And part of what I'm doing is trying to put together a group that's going to work together. So there's a lot of other factors, but what ends up happening is that it's much more for me about the team and the founder and who the people are and what the quality of the conversation that we're having is than it is you know, some kind of objective looking at the market opportunity or something that's more data driven. But how do you figure that out even for 290 companies in such a short time? So I have this... I'm hoping you're going to reveal a big secret that we can steal. I'll, I'll, I'm not going to reveal a big secret, but I'll tell you something that has given me a lot of comfort in how I make decisions. So I'm very gut driven, right? And I used to feel defensive about this because the idea is if you're not, if you're using gut, you're not using data. What I've realized is that how our brains work is actually when we're making decisions on our gut, we are processing a huge amount of data. We're just doing it in an unconscious way. So I've learned to trust my gut because when I'm sitting talking to someone for 10 minutes, I am um, absorbing everything from what market they're in, how long they've been doing it, who they're working with, how they communicate, what kind of questions they ask me, how excited they seem, all of these things that are actually objective factors that are important in evaluating. And I'm processing them all at the same time and getting to a yes or no decision in a way that I don't really fully understand. And I've had to just get comfortable with that form of decision making because there's no way I can run a process in this short time frame any other way. The way our model works, I don't have to have a company become a $300 million company in order for it to be a great and exciting investment. We're coming in so early and I don't actually think we can take companies that aren't necessarily venture scale businesses and have that be okay. So not every company has to be shooting for that, you know, potential unicorn status. I do want to make sure, cause that was one of my just clarifying points is like, how does your investment work? And I want to come back to your investment thesis, but, um, but I do want to make sure I cover the basics of how much money you guys actually invest into the companies. So the way we think about Techstars is for the program, we come in as a common shareholder, which to us is really important because all our values are about being aligned with founders. So to participate in Techstars, it's 6% of your common stock. Plus for that, we give you $20,000, which isn't meant to reflect a valuation event. It's, that is meant as a, to cover your expenses during the program. In addition, because we don't want founders distracted by being capital constrained during the program, we offer a 100,000 convertible note that's at a 3 million cap because most of the companies coming in haven't raised money. So that's, you know, that's our standard deal. If they have raised money previously at a higher cap, the cap will float to match that cap up to 5 million. But the standard deal is a 300, is a $3 million cap. So they're getting $120,000. We're coming in as a shareholder in two ways, common and preferred, and we're really making you know a big bet, um, mostly in the terms in terms of allocating our time, energy, resources, network, know-how, and relationships over the life of the company to helping this company be successful. Cool. 
I actually, I, w I wasn't entirely sure how it worked. Um, great. Uh, so just going backwards to um, to that the conversation about like I, I know you've invested in you know satellite companies to shoe companies or something, right? Like it's it's pretty broad. You're trusting your gut, but you also have some things you've talked about. Is that not a fair characterization? <laughs> no, I think it's great. I just think about it. It's real. It's like ridiculous. Right. So it's ridiculous, but we'll grant you that. <laughs> no, it, it it's great. Uh, I, I think it, it, it works for you, but you also do have some things probably that you would invest more of. Like, I think I've heard you talk about e-commerce or there's some areas that you're particularly passionate about. De there definitely are. Although before I get to that, um, somebody said to me in one of these meeting, in one of these mentor meetings, I can't remember who it was, but he goes, I've been trying to figure out what your investment thesis is and what all these companies have in common. And I realized it's that all the founders have high EQ. Oh, that's good. And, and I was like, that's, that's it. You know, that is it. Um, it's not actually true, because I can think of a couple that turned out not to have such high EQ. But, um, but that is definitely what I look for. Um, and that's what I care about, because that's founders who have high EQ are coachable. They have grit. They have resilience. You know, they have a learning mindset. They have a lot of the things that I think are highly correlated with success. So I've, right now, I've got a, a company that is selling um, Chinese hot sauce. I had the shoe company. I had <laughs> <laughs> the satellite data analytics, um, you know, marketplaces. I have a lot of companies focused on payments right now. There is no sector focus, um, but high EQ. But there are a couple of things where I tend to over index, let's just say. So e commerce, um, I love e commerce enabling technologies, particularly ones that help direct to consumer brands really scale. Um, what they're able to do from a tech perspective. So companies like Prism or Shipsy or Catalog from last year that are all supporting direct-to-consumer brands um, and helping them compete against the larger brands. Another one this year is, is payments, both on the consumer and the B2B side. So I feel that you know we're in a real revolution in terms of financial services and how we access financial services you know, as consumers, and there's just a ton of exciting stuff going on. And it's great to see that happening in LA, which hasn't been traditionally a hotbed for fintech. But it seems like accelerators, incubators, studios, it's hard to keep up with the whole spectrum of what's going on today. Do you have thoughts on just sort of the, the, the ecosystem of accelerators? Yes, sure. I mean, so I think to your question about kind of who is it right for and who's who's kind of drawn to it. So I think it tends to come in two categories. One is the company that's founded by people who really maybe just starting out and they feel like maybe they need some extra support or they need um, they need the basics in kind of how to, how to run a company and how to approach the problem. That's sort of one category and that's a great, that's a great candidate because that team's gonna come in and be really coachable. The second one, which is a less great candidate, is, oh, I wasn't able to raise money, so I'm going to go do an accelerator to kind of buy more time. Right? I try to stay away from that really far away because they're not here to learn and they're not buying into the value proposition of what we really offer here. They're just looking at it as a way to kind of buy more time and maybe, um, you know, or a Hail Mary to kind of figure something out. My absolute favorite founders are founders that have had success before or have had failure before, have had, you know, ex are experienced and know firsthand how difficult it is to, to um, build a company and do enough research on this program and on me and on what they're gonna do here and have a really well-developed thesis about what they're gonna work on while they're here and what they wanna get out of it. And so come in both with a really strong background themselves but also like a learning agenda and holding me and us to a high standard of what we're going to bring to the table to help them grow. Like those are my favorite people. And we have a lot of those people here right now who are, they're older. One of the things we talk about the most here this year is how to parent while you're starting a company. Hmm. You know, we have a ton of people that are parents. We have a ton of people that are career switchers. Those are the founders that I personally find myself most drawn to partly because of my own advanced age. <laughs> great. Please don't say that. I think we're exactly the same age. <laughs> yes, we are. It's one of my favorite things about you. Um, one thing I always like to ask people is is about advice, um, because I mean, to some degree, your your role here is a coach and advice giver. So, uh, you know, is there advice that you hear given that you disagree with from your mentors, or is there advice that you find yourself giving over and over? So, 
you know, one of the things that just truisms about venture that I really disagree with um, is the idea that, you know, a founder is a 26 year old kind of wall breaker type of personality. I think in my experience that model no longer applies. I think that was a very effective model when to build a new software company, you had to do a lot of coding from scratch. And so it involved kind of putting in really long hours in order to get a product out. The way software is developed now um, and the amount of kind of um, shortcuts and tools um, that are available to build a, you know, deeply effective software product, that's no longer true, and I think experience counts for more now. So I don't buy into that model, and, and I think there's well-published data that shows this, that if you look at companies that have IPO'd, the average age of the founder is 45. It's not 26. So that's one thing. The other thing that I just, you know, this move fast and break things, I think a lot of people dump on that idea, and, and I just, for me, I think there's a way of moving fast without breaking things. I think that framing of what we're looking to do, which is learn quickly, is um, um, that I just don't like the framing of, about, about breaking things. I think it's possible to move fast, which means to me having an aggressive learning agenda and not wasting time once you've learned that something isn't working. And I just prefer not to you know, think about it as needing to break things in order to learn quickly. I also think it depends at the scale of your company, right? Move fast and break things does not work if you're Google and Facebook. We have learned but when you're a smaller company, the learn aggressively is, I like that. What it feels to me is the important um, nugget there is not letting fear get in the way. So I'll give you an example. I have a company that has 10,000 downloads on their app and they're very scared to change anything in the app. And what I was just saying was, you know, 10,000 is not a lot. The people that are opening that app, you know, every day you could probably count on a few hands even. So you really shouldn't let the fear of upsetting your users at this point stop you from doing wild experiments. Now is exactly the time to do those wild experiments. It's one of the things that impresses me most about Snap is that those guys, they have a lot of users. They have way more than 10,000, but they seem to be willing to just put in new UI on a dime and believe in it and go for it and go for it and really commit and it right? works and not letting the fear of pissing that person, you know, that one customer, that small group of customers off kind of get in your way. Cause the fact is if you change any, anything, someone's going to be upset. You know, another piece of advice you, you know, you were asking me about, um, advice that I've given this week. Um, you know, another piece of advice that I gave someone this week was, uh, that part of his job as the CEO wasn't just to figure it out, um, but to command um, confidence in the people that he was talking to, both customers and investors. And he was so, hel this is someone who just eats data for breakfast, is really, really data driven, and um, you know knows everything about his business, but you sit across from him and he's kind of twitchy and can't sit still in his chair and constantly having to take deep breaths. And I was like, it doesn't matter how much you understand about the numbers under the hood if you are conveying a sense of anxiety and stress, because that's not going to give someone the confidence to you like put money in you. So it's kind of getting people to focus on the softer skills is something that we, you know, that I try to do, and helping people move from that idea of I'm a solo entrepreneur in my garage building something to I'm a CEO with a vision who's going to build a team. If we can help companies cross from founders cross from that side to the other, then we've succeeded. That's terrific. Well, this has been so helpful, and I think anybody who is interested in coming to TechStars, and particularly TechStars LA, will find this super, super useful. So thank you for taking the time. Thanks for having me. Great conversation. Oh, super fun. Thanks. I could have gone on and on. Me Thanks. too. Yeah. Thank you for listening to LA Venture. If you enjoyed the show, please feel free to rate and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and Spotify. It makes a big difference in helping others find the podcast. For more information on 10110 Ventures, please visit 10110.net.